Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Ispensky by Maurice Nicole Volume 1 The Idea of Transformation in the Work Birdlip, July 30, 1941 Part 1 As some of you know, it has been suggested by Mr. Ispensky that this work might be called by the name Psychotransformism. The idea of the work is psychological transformation, the transformation of oneself. Transformation means the changing of a thing into a different thing. Chemistry studies the possible transformation of matter. There are well-known transformations of matter. For example, sugar can be transformed into alcohol, and alcohol into vinegar by the action of ferments. This is the transformation of one molecular substance into another molecular substance. In the new chemistry of the atoms and elements, radium slowly transforms itself into lead. As you know, the transformation of base metal into gold has always been dreamed of as possible by the alchemists of the past. But this idea did not always have a literal meaning, because the language of alchemy was sometimes used by secret schools of teaching as referring to the possibility of the transformation of man into a new kind of man. Man as he is, that is, mechanical man serving nature and grounded in violence, was represented as base metal, and the transformation of base metal into gold referred to this possible transformation latent in him. In the Gospels, the idea of mechanical man as a seed capable of growing has the same significance, as has also the idea of rebirth, of a man being born again. As you know, in this system of teaching, man is regarded as a three-story factory, taking in three foods, ordinary food on the lower floor of the factory, air on the second floor, and impressions on the third floor. The food we eat undergoes successive transformations. The process of life is transformation. Every living thing lives by transforming one thing into another. A plant transforms air, water, and salts from the earth into new substances, into what we call potatoes, beans, peas, nuts, fruit, and so on, by the action of sunlight and ferments. The sensitive living film spread over the earth, which conducts force from the universe, that is, organic life, is a vast transforming organ. When we eat food, it is transformed successively, stage by stage, into all the substances necessary for our existence. This is done by that mind called instinctive center, which controls the inner work of the organism and of course knows far more than we do about it. We can understand that when food is taken, digestion begins. Digestion is transformation. The food is changed into something different in the stomach. This is only the first stage of the transformation of food, and is designated in the work as the passage of Do 768 to Re 384. It will be sufficient to use this first stage as an example without going further. It is a stage everyone can understand without difficulty. Everyone can see that the food taken into the lowest compartment of the three-story factory, namely the meals we eat, undergoes transformation. Now suppose the food passed into the stomach and nothing happened. What then? The body, which is like a huge town, will make no contact with it. How can an undigested piece of meat or a potato enter the bloodstream and supply the necessary fine substance, say, to the brain? The situation is more or less the case, however, in regard to the third food, the food of impressions. They enter and remain undigested. That is, there is no transformation here. Impressions come in as dough 48 and stop. Save for a very small amount of transformation, nothing takes place. There is no adequate transformation of impressions. It is not necessary for the purpose of nature that man should transform impressions, but a man can transform his impressions himself, 
if he has sufficient knowledge and understands why it is necessary. Most people think that external life will give them what they crave and seek. Life comes in as impressions, as Doe 48. The first realization of the meaning of this work is to understand that life, coming in as impressions, must be transformed. There is no such thing as external life. But all the time you are receiving is impressions. You see a person you dislike. That is, you get impressions of this nature. You see a person you like. That is, you get impressions once more. Life is impressions. Not a solid material thing such as you suppose and believe is reality. Your reality is your impressions. I know this idea is very difficult to grasp. It forms a very difficult crossing place. You are perhaps sure that life exists as such and not as your impressions. The person you see sitting in a chair, wearing a blue suit, smiling and talking, you think is real. No, it is your impressions of him that are real for you. If you had no sight, you would not see him. If you had no ears, you would not hear him. Life comes in as impressions, and it is here that it is possible to work on oneself. But only if you realize that what you are working on is not external life, but the impressions you are receiving. Unless you can grasp this, you will never understand the meaning of what in the work is called the first conscious shock. This shock relates to these impressions, which are all we know of the outer world that we are taking in, that we are taking as actual things, actual people. No one can transform external life, but everyone can transform his impressions, namely the third and highest food taken in by the three-story factory. For this reason, the system of teaching says that it is necessary to create a transforming agency at the point of intake of impressions. This is the meaning of the work, regarded in the light of psychological transformation, and this is the point at which work begins. It is called the first conscious shock because it is something not done mechanically. It does not happen mechanically. That is, it needs a conscious effort. A man who begins to understand what this means, at the same time begins to be no longer a mechanical man serving nature, a man asleep and merely used by nature for its own purposes, which are not in the interests of man. If you now think of the meaning of all you are taught to do in the way of effort, beginning with self-observation, you will see beyond any doubt that everything on the practical side of this work relates to transforming impressions and the results of impressions. Work on negative emotions, work on heavy moods, work on identifying, work on considering, work on inner lying, work on imagination, work on difficult eyes, work on self-justifying, work on states of sleep, and so on is all connected with transforming impressions and the results of them. So you will agree that in a sense work on oneself is comparable to digestion in the sense that digestion is transformation. Some transforming agency must be formed at the place of the intake of impressions. This is the first conscious shock and it is given the general description remembering oneself. If you can, through the understanding of the work, take life as work, then you are in a state of self-remembering. This state of consciousness leads to the transformation of impressions, and so of life as regards yourself. That is, life no longer acts on you in the old way. You begin to think and to understand in a new way, and this is the beginning of your own transformation. For as long as we think in the same way, we take in life in the same way, and nothing changes in us. To transform the impressions of life is to transform oneself, and only an entirely new way of thinking can effect this. All this work is to give you an entirely new way of thinking. Let me give you one example. 
You were told in the work that if you are negative, it is always your own fault. The whole situation as recorded by the senses must be transformed. But to understand this, it is necessary to begin to think in an entirely new way. You all can understand that life is continually causing us to react to it. All these reactions form our life, our own personal life. To change one's life is not to change outer circumstances, it is to change one's reactions. But unless we can see that outer life comes in as impressions, which cause us to react in stereotyped ways, we cannot see where the point of possible change comes in, where it is possible to work. If the reactions that form your own personal life are mainly negative, then that is your life. Your life is chiefly a mass of negative reactions to the impressions that have come in every day. The transformation of impressions so that they do not always provoke negative reactions is then one's task, if one wishes to work on oneself. But for this self-observation at the point where impressions enter us is necessary. Then one can let the impressions fall in a negative mechanical way, or not. If not, then that is to begin to live more consciously. If one fails to transform impressions at the moment of their entry, one can always work on the results of these impressions and prevent them from having their full mechanical effect. All this requires a definite feeling, a definite evaluation of the work, for it means that the work must be brought forward, as it were, to that point where impressions enter and are being distributed mechanically to their customary place in personality to evoke the old reactions. We will speak later much more about transformation, but it can be added that no higher level is possible of attainment unless there is transformation. And the very idea of transformation is based on the fact that different levels exist and refers to the passage from one level to another level of being. No one can reach a higher level of development without transformation. Part 2. The Idea of Transformation in the Work Birdlip, August 14, 1941 The personality that we all acquire receives the impressions of life, but it does not transform them because it is dead. If impressions fell on essence, they would be transformed because they would fall on centers. Personality, which is the term applied to all that we acquire, and we must acquire personality, translates impressions from every side of life in a limited and practically stereotyped way according to its quality and associations. The personality in this respect is sometimes compared in the work with a secretary who sits in the front room, dealing with everything according to her own ideas. She has a number of dictionaries and encyclopedias and reference books, etc., round about her and rings up the three centers, that is, the mental, the emotional, and the physical centers, according to her limited ideas. The result is that the wrong centers are nearly always being rung up. This means that incoming impressions are sent to the wrong places and produce the wrong results. A man's life depends on this secretary who mechanically looks up things in her reference books without any understanding of what they really mean and transmits them accordingly without caring what happens, but feeling only that she is doing her duty. This is our inner situation. What is important to understand in this allegory is that this personality which we all acquire and must acquire begins to take charge of our lives, and it is no use imagining that this only happens to certain people. It happens to everyone. Whoever we are, we find ourselves, through self-observation, possessed of a certain small number of typical ways of reacting to the manifold impressions of incoming life. These mechanical reactions govern us. Everyone is governed by his own set of reactions to impressions, that is, to life, whether he is revolutionary or conservative, or good or bad in the ordinary sense. 
and these reactions are his life. Mankind is mechanical in this sense. A man has formed in him a number of reactions which he takes as himself, and his life experiences are the result of them. If you can relax enough physically and drop away mentally from all ideas of yourself, which is mental relaxing, you will be able to see what I mean. You will see that, as it were, there are a number of things below you, namely external to you, that you keep on taking as yourself. In such a passive state you can see them dimly. At first sight they may seem to be above you. Immediately you tense your muscles or begin to talk, you become them. They become you or you become them, and off you go again. But you must not try to do this exercise too much at first. Actually, they are like little grasping machines that insist on taking charge of you and demanding that you should enter them again. They are set in motion by this secretary, that is, by the habitual way this secretary responds to impressions, and the reactions which follow we take as life. We take our typical reactions to impressions as life. We take our reactions to a person as him or her. All life, that is, outer life, which is what we usually think life is, namely what we see and hear, is for each person his or her reactions to the impressions coming in from it. And as I said in the last talk, it is a great mistake to think that what is called life is a solid fixed thing, the same for everyone. No one has the same impressions of life. Life is our impressions of it, and these can be transformed. But as was said, this is a very difficult idea to reach, because the hypnotism of the senses is so powerful. We cannot help thinking that it is only the senses that give us reality. So our inner life, our real life of thought and feeling, remains dim to our mental conceptions. Yet at the same time we know quite well it is where we really live, that is, in our thoughts and feelings. To establish a point in the work, to make it more real than life, we must observe ourselves and make our inner life of thoughts and feelings a fact more powerful than any fact given by our senses. This is the beginning of transforming. One cannot transform anything in oneself if one is glued to the senses. As I said in the last talk, the work teaches that if you are negative, it is your own fault. The sensory point of view is that this or that person in the outer world, that you see and hear by means of your eyes and ears, is at fault. This person, you will say, because he or she does this or talks like that, is to blame. But actually, if you are made negative, what you have to work on, what you have to observe, is this negative emotion intruding itself into your inner life, that is, into the inner invisible place where you really exist. Your real being is in the inner invisible world of yourself. Do you wish to argue this point? Well, are the thoughts and feelings and emotions and hopes and despairs you have less real to you than the tables and chairs in your dining room? Do you live, as it were, in this dining room? You may be very much identified with your particular tables and chairs, but even so, is it not your feeling about these tables and chairs that is real to you? Suppose you are ill and feel perhaps death is near you. Do you bother any more about them? Of course not. And why? Because you have no longer any feelings about them. It is your feelings and your way of identifying that make you regard this or that thing as important. It is not the things that you see with your physical eyes. Let us suppose that a person notices that he is identified, say, with his furniture. Do you think that he must get rid of his furniture in order to change? Of course not. That would be silly. What he can change is his being identified so much. If he works on this, if he begins to transform this reaction in himself, 
He can still enjoy his furniture, but he will not commit suicide if it is destroyed in a fire. Do you see the difference? You cannot transform life, but you can begin to transform the way you take life. The first conscious shock means work on yourself in general. The point of this work is to try to give oneself this shock. Everything that is taught in this system, on the practical side, belongs to the first conscious shock, non-identifying, non-considering, and so on. This may lead to a real moment of self-remembering as a reward. Then one has insight into what one must do and realization of the truth of the work. But work must be done in the spirit of the work, that is, in the sense and feeling and valuation of the work. This must enter into every effort of work, for no one can work for himself alone, otherwise the results go only into false personality and so into merit. A man must work from love of the work. This brings hydrogen 12 up to the place of incoming impressions. Incoming impressions are hydrogen 48. They cannot pass to hydrogen 24 without hydrogen 12 as active force. If this hydrogen is present at the place of reception of impressions, that is, at the place we are conscious, hydrogen 48, which comes in as passive force, passes to hydrogen 24, the triad being completed by the carbon 12. Hydrogen 12 is not present naturally at this point in the human machine. It has to be brought up to this point. If a person takes life as usual in the ordinary way, that is, always receives impressions in the same mechanical way and speaks from them in the same mechanical way and acts from them in the same mechanical way, then nothing can change in the person. Such people cannot evolve. They do not see where the point of working on themselves lies. They think work is something outside them. A person must bring a very powerful hydrogen to the point where impressions are coming in. This is hydrogen 12. 